so next person we have is uh, Rand Decker. So she wrote on um, citizens and states, or uh, sorry, um, police responses to digital vigilantism. So just to introduce her a bit more before we go ahead. Uh, so she's an assistant professor at the, at the Utrecht University School of Governance. She also studies social media as a modern source of social pressure within governance in two societal domains. So first, public security and second, migration and integration. And finally, she uses co-design methods, including the Living Lab, method, uh, Living Lab methodology as an engaged research practice. Uh, so, Grant, I live, yeah, I live to see you. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you, uh, Laura. And uh, I'd like to join the uh, the previous speakers in expressing my thanks for organizing this very nice event and also for uh, having been able to contribute a chapter to this uh, to this very nice volume. Um, I've uh, co-authored a chapter together with my colleague Albert Meyer, also from the Utrecht uh, School of Governance, on police responses to digital vigilantism. We are both in the Department of Public Governance, so that uh, is what, uh, what interested us. Um, let me skip to the next. So uh, many acts of digital vigilantism relate to police and law enforcement uh, efforts. So we've seen some examples in the previous presentations, but you might also think of web sleuths, uh, pedophile hunters, hacktivists, and online neighborhood watch groups. Um, uh, they engage in different ways with police and law enforcement practices. And what's interesting is that the different labels that are used by law enforcement and, uh, and government to, uh, to denote these practices uh, highlight differences in perception, whether these are helpful or harmful acts. So sometimes they are referred to as vigilante acts, but also sometimes they, they are considered to be do-it-yourself policing or co-production of public security. So we wondered uh, where does law enforcement draw these discursive boundaries in what acts are harmful or helpful? And we've explored this in a series of workshops with European law enforcement agencies. Um, uh, in total, uh, around 200 uh, participants uh, uh, participated from police, from government agencies, and also NGOs. And in a series of dialogues, they, uh, they discuss different examples of digital vigilantism. So what were, uh, did we find? So first, the accepted forms of, uh, of online co-production or, or vigilantism, but then in the positive uh, uh, frame, of course, um, is that it's uh, engagement with crime prevention. So the early stages of these um, acts. So denouncement of crimes, but also sharing crime prevention warnings. These are uh, um, uh, no doubt accepted uh, um, uh, practices and acts. And also engagement with the next stages of crime fighting, but only when collaboration with police is sought already in the earlier stages. And also when it concerns local issues, so issues happening in someone's direct vicinity and in someone's community itself, not issues taking place in other countries and uh, in uh, other places, then they start wondering, well, why would these people be motivated to uh, help uh, in crime fighting in these uh, cases? So the lights here are going out <laughs> because I was uh, sitting too long. Uh, <laughs> okay, so I'm back. Uh, and then on to the uh, disputed forms of uh, online co-production, or uh, then in that case, digital vigilantism. And that are the acts that move beyond uh, people's uh, direct uh, uh, environment and also beyond collaboration with police from the early stages. So the, the accepted forms closely reflect a traditional strategy of community policing that's also been happening offline. So beyond these practices, there are concerns for, on the one hand, harm to citizens and society um, in case of premature accusations of suspects as offenders, um, a focus on only effectiveness and not on process values in these uh, acts of crime fighting, 
and also unprofessional standards of investigation of and punishments. So, for example, when citizens act as judge, jury, and executioner in these uh, cases. Uh, law enforcement also fears harm to police work. So even in the uh, accepted forms of uh, 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 do-it-yourself policing, they fear that it might overburden police with information about new cases. It might jeopardize ongoing investigations by disclosing information, uh, but also prosecution if there's already been a lot of attention for a certain case. And lastly, it might also, there's also concern that it might undermine police authority when um, uh, citizens take matters in their own hands. So to conclude, uh, what we found really interesting is that, that the accepted forms closely mirror this uh, practice of community policing. But what does that mean? When the notions of locality are shifting by these digital means, but also what does collaboration exactly mean? And not only bringing cases to the police, but can the police also really collaborate with these citizens? Um, we've also seen throughout Europe different efforts to create more guidance for uh, do-it-yourself policing groups and individuals. So, for example, in the Netherlands, there have been efforts to create apps that help people out to, um, uh, uh, to in crime fighting related to very simple cases close to home. Um, but also by regulating it, by providing training, etc. And lastly, uh, an interesting uh, question is if and uh, how the police can harness the power of citizen self-organization against crime. Can this be done uh, without uh, uh, having the harmful effects of uh, digital vigilantism? So thank you. Uh, I think the, the one example that really um, uh, is most uh, contested is that of pedophile hunters, online pedophile hunter groups, also because the question there is, is it, um, uh, is it about um, uh, um, online shaming of existing crimes or also in, inciting or provoking crimes uh, amongst these groups? So is it creating new uh, acts that are... Uh, uh, happening. Um, and of course, it's very easy for the police, and we've seen that happening in the Netherlands over the uh, past months to say, well, don't do it, just stop. But I don't think that's a, a helpful way of, uh, of dealing with digital vigilantism. It's there. And it's, uh, and I, uh, well, we've seen also during the COVID-19 pandemic, there's been online shaming of people uh, not staying at home and uh, 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 not uh, living by the, the new uh, uh, measures to tackle this pandemic. So I think instead of just saying, no, don't do it, police should come up with new ways of engaging with these groups. And for example, in the case of pedophile hunter groups, it's, uh, uh, there's, uh, it's uh, uh, difficult to, uh, uh, to deal with people exposing others, but police have a lot of uh, need to um, to tackle the online world, for example, of networks on the deep web, uh, exchanging uh, uh, photographs and materials. So any um, help with, uh, uh, with leads on these networks would be, uh, 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 would be worth a lot more than these individuals and these very borderline cases that are provoked rather than exposed by these uh, uh, vigilante groups. So I think that would be a way forward to, uh, for the police, not just saying, no, don't do it, but to direct groups of digital vigilantes to acts that really could, uh, uh, could support law enforcement efforts. <laughs>